nice background image, Victor. <laughs> thank you, thank you. The modern office. Welcome to attendees. We will begin shortly. A quick reminder that this event will be recorded. Good morning from Northern Virginia. My name is Juhi Nathani. I'm going to be your host today, and I'm Assistant Director of International Business Investment at the Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. We're so excited to have you here for our first ever Zoomference, Back to Business, Resilience, Recovery, and Moving Forward. I'd like to invite to kick us all off, uh, President and CEO of Fairfax County Economic Development Authority, Mr. Victor Hoskins. Victor. Thank you so much, Juhi. And thank you for the opportunity to speak to you this morning. Uh, we're really excited about um, this, this workshop, this webinar. It's gonna provide information that many of us need. Uh, but before I begin, I'd like to congratulate really my, 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 my team. Uh, for the excellent, um, yeah, excellent group of people that they brought together. Uh, Ju Juhi Nat Nahanti, <laughs> there I go, Juhi, <laughs> Juhi Jatinder, um, Mike Batts, John Blair, Spencer Wood, all the people who really put this lineup together, um, Andrew and Connie and, and Katie, all the folks who really uh, provide a lot of the background on this. And what you're going to see is that the, the panelists are going to share their expertise and their experiences. And this is a testament to the kind of leadership that we have in our county. All levels of government have worked together remarkably well, quickly um, in helping businesses get back into business. Um, with the on the federal level, with the PPP and the EIDL loans, um, really the federal government has responded. Um, our public health agencies have responded, and the regulatory changes that are taking place in the states to accommodate business at this level is really an unprecedented uh, set of circumstances. One of the fantastic things about Fairfax County and many counties in Northern Virginia, they have come up with grant programs um, directly to businesses to augment uh, some of these loan programs that uh, the, the SBA and the federal government have, have provided. And this is really helping a lot of companies bridge that gap. But today what we're gonna talk about is the resilience uh, that we have in place. Um, our business practices, um, our technology workers, our educated workforce, um, have really created a resilience um, like um, almost no other place um, in the country. There may be two or three other places uh, that are going to be able to weather this storm, like the D.C. area. Um, one of the more um, interesting things about our region is that we have um, the government here, um, and that government combined with our technology expertise has really allowed us to um, set ourselves in a position to grow um, out of this difficulty. And we have been through these difficult times before. Uh, when 9-11 hit, um, I remember friends telling me, I'll never fly again. Um, I remember one of my friends telling me, I'll, I'll never, there'll never be another tall building built. Well, more people have flown since 9-11 and more tall buildings have been built all around the world since 9-11. So what we feel at the moment is not what plays out um, in reality. Um, I remember the riots um, in 1992. I was in Los Angeles area um, working in economic development. It was a disaster, and many people said that LA wouldn't come back. Well, LA is one of the strongest economies on the globe right now. Um, 
And our workplaces have been evolving for 100 years, and they are going to continue to evolve. But right now, what we're going to do is pay more attention to health. Um, back a century ago, fire safety was a big concern. Um, we, we certainly worked through that. Um, there have been other issues in the workplace um, that have been, been concerned, and we've worked through those, and we're going to work through these. Um, in Northern Virginia, like I said, we have a resilient economy. We have partners in the counties around us, in Alexandria, Arlington, Loudoun County, Prince William County, um, Fairfax City. We are all working together uh, to get business back into business. I'm, a, I'm an optimist. I'll, I'll admit it. I, I confess. Um, but I do know this. There's nothing um, that is going to keep uh, this region down. There's nothing that's going to keep this nation down. And there's nothing that's going to keep um, us from getting back into business. We're going to have great sessions today. Um, there will be sessions on best practices. Um, and, and Jatinder is going to moderate the first panel, um, a series of experts um, from the U.S. government, um, from um, U.S. banking and Caribbean operations, uh, from the public sector of Akamai. Um, we have uh, another panel, which is going to really focus on the ways in which organizations have used to provide technology to keep businesses running as usual. Um, and that's going to be led by John Blair. And then we have a, a break. And after that, we're going to have Mike, Mike Batts lead a session on the future of work, um, where he's going to have uh, people from, from PwC and other organizations in Northern Virginia that really are at the cutting edge of what our workplace is going to be like in the future. And with that, I would like to turn it back over to Judy. Thank you, Victor. Thank you very much for your very encouraging words. And we can't wait to get started on this. So once again, um, welcome, everybody. We are at 95 and counting right now as people join in. Before we get into our first panel, I have a few housekeeping notes that I'd like to share with you. This event is being recorded and we will have video recordings available on our website later. You are free to leave and rejoin sessions. My recommendation is that you don't exit out of Zoom and that way you can still step away and catch back up right where you left off. Uh, we will have two scheduled breaks during our programming today. And that should give you time to check on your emails, go grab some coffee, or just stretch. Um, as attendees, your audio and video is disabled. However, you do have access to the Q&A box during various times throughout the program. Feel free to pose your questions right there. And when you do exit the Zoom conference, please make sure to fill out a very short survey of four questions we have for you. We'd love to get your feedback. All right, so I assume everybody is ready to get started. And like I said, we have 100 participants on right now. I want to first poll the audience. I'm here in Tyson's, as you see behind me. I'd like to know where you are. So my question for you is, where in the world are you now? You should see the poll up on your screen. Let us know whether you're in the DMV, elsewhere in North America, Europe, Asia, Middle East, or anywhere else in the world. I know we have a very diverse audience in front of us today. And answers are trickling in. Okay, here we go. We have most of the people joining us from the DMV area, but I'm very pleased to see that we have people from elsewhere in the United States and Canada, Europe and Asia joining us as well. Welcome to one and all from Tyson's Fairfax County, Northern Virginia. So if um, we are all ready to get started, we are gonna kick it off with our first panel. And that is going to be led by your moderator, my good friend and colleague, Jatinder Khosla. Over to you, Jatinder. Thank you so much, Juhi. Um, well, given the audience, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everybody. My name is Jatinder Khosla. I am the Business Investment Manager for Europe here at Fairfax County Economic Development Authority. We have a great panel lined up for you today on business best practices. I do want to point out to please save your questions until the very end 
um, when we will be doing audience Q&A. So coming back to our panel, as the title suggests, the overarching theme of our panel is business resiliency at a time of great uncertainty. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to our esteemed panelists and ask them to introduce themselves. So Mark, let's start with you. Tell us a little bit about Rycon and your background and role at the company. Sure, happy to. Thank you, Jatender. Um, <clears throat> I'm a 3D geospatial team lead for Brycon. I joined Brycon in 2015 to help stand up our US production team. Um, I've been in geospatial intelligence data production for about 15 years, um, previously with the Boeing company and, and Titan Systems. Um, and Brycon as a company uh, was formed in 2015 from a joint venture between uh, Maxar, formerly Digital Globe, um, and Saab AB in Sweden. Brycon combines cutting edge remote sensing and imagery uh, from Maxar together with an automated, with automated image uh, uh, processing algorithms from Saab um, development to build some of the highest resolution and most accurate 3D maps um, of the entire planet. Um, Brycon has 92 employees um, with our US-based uh, offices here in McLean, Virginia and Orlando, um, along with our uh, Swedish team based in uh, Lynn Shoping, Sweden. Great, thank you, Mark. Ashish, do you wanna kick it off and talk about NewGen? Oh, you're on mute, Ashish. Thanks for inviting us over. And I guess uh, this is going to be a, a very engaging session. So I head the financial services for Nugent Software, have been a part of uh, Nugent Software for the last 20 years, part of the executive leadership team out here. And uh, as a part of uh, what we do, so Nugent is a truly global organization with operations in 66 countries. And uh, we specialize on business process management and enterprise content management, especially focused on digital transformation, which we are, which is so relevant in today's times. And only the definition of it is changing every single day. But uh, as we move through the panel, we'll talk about our experiences, uh, leave a couple of thoughts from a blueprint standpoint, what we have experienced, what has worked for us, and uh, happy to be here. Thank you, Ashish. Gautam, uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about uh, Alpha Omega? Gautam, you're on mute. Sorry about that. No worries. All right. Uh, thanks, Jitinda. Um, I'm the uh, president of Alpha Omega Integration, a federal IT system integrator. We haven't been in business for a very long time, having started in September of 2016. However, we've been fortunate to have faced some extraordinary growth, uh, earning us a place in the Inc. 5000 at position 355 position 143 and position 30 over 2018, 2019, and 2020. Our focus is mainly on uh, high-end application engineering, low-code, no-code, open source applications on one hand, cloud engineering and high-performance computing, uh, and serverless architecture on the infrastructure side. We are likely to end this year at about 50 million per year in revenue and over 250 employees to give you an idea of our size. Uh, and that's a little bit about Alpha Omega, Jitendra. Thank you, Gautam. Um, so uh, my next question to everybody is, we're gonna do a little bit of time travel. We're gonna go back to March 30th and Virginia Governor Northam has just issued the stay at home order for all Virginians. So what would you say were the top three decisions that your company's leadership decided to take to ensure business continuity? And any, I, I welcome anybody's uh, response first. You know, the top three decisions, let me see. First, our response to COVID-19, uh, the threat at Alpha Omega integration was decisive. Ahead of the stay, uh, stay at home order on March 16th, in within 12 hours, we moved to 100% remote work and closed our office. We secured confirmations from our clients to allow teleworking with, dis with zero disruptions. Today, 97% of our people are now working from home. There are about 3% uh, 
mission critical staff that support production systems who are still on site. Second, we removed access to the office for all employees, no exceptions. Our employees' health is the number one concern. A few years ago, we made the investment, and I'm glad we did so, to migrate all our applications to the cloud and secure Office 365 for every employee. This really skyrocketed our staff's ability to work from home. And finally, you know, social distancing does not mean we have to emotionally distance ourselves. Uh, our HR team jumped into action to implement employee engagement activities, training, movies, crazy hat days, pajama parties, virtual happy hours, you name it, we did it all. And that to over MS teams remotely. We recently had an employee host a music concert remotely. We, we started a running club and a book reading club to motivate each other and encourage mm -hmm. each other to run. And, and, and there were prizes. This engagement paid off and I'm proud to say our teams delivered with a same or better efficiency and spirit that they show customers when on site. That's great. So, yeah. so, go, go ahead, Ashes. So I think uh, from our perspective, uh, I would just like to you know quote uh, the Alice in Wonderland kind of scenario, wherein Alice is running and she's saying that, hey, in my country, when I run, I read somewhere and I leave the trees behind. And the queen says mm -hmm. that, hey, you know what? This is a this is a different country. In this country, when you run at this speed, you stay where you are, and if you have to read somewhere, you have to run at twice the speed, and that's what the scenario was with us. And uh, we understood that the definition of the speed is going to change: speed of execution, speed of service, speed of safety, speed of delivery, the speed of uh, in which we sell. All these things are going to change a lot. So that was, I would say, we divided our plan in terms of our day zero strategy our day zero to day 60 strategy, and then day 60 and beyond. One of the things which was critical, and as we are a global organization with more than 3000 employees and 66 countries of operations, I think it was extremely important for us that how do we prepare and prevent from a safety standpoint of all the employees, our customers, and safety was not only in terms of the safety of the health of the employees, it was safety of operations, safety of protecting the revenues part of it, and also making sure that the entire infrastructure is in place. Um, our, our teams actually worked day in, day out, and uh, in less than 36 hours, all the 3,000 employees were back in safe places, all the operations were restored, and certainly being a technology company, we had an edge on that, but I think that really worked well for us. The second very important thing for us was communication because we all know from the past that whenever these things happen, it leads to a chaos. And what was most important was that, how do we ensure that clear, consistent and collaborative communication goes from the top to the bottom? We made COVID response teams, which was also a centralized and decentralized operations because of which all this communication went back to our customers, our suppliers, our partners, and to our employees. The third thing which was extremely important for us was in terms of uh, making the scenario planning. And this is a thought that I would like to leave with you all. I think we prepared for the worst case and the best case scenario. Best case was still very uh, pessimistic because we took an approach in terms of what would happen in the next 60 days. Will the stay at home be lifted in 60 days and we prepared ourselves for that. And the second thing we did was that the worst case scenario that if it is continues for six months, so the intent was to make that scenario analysis and make sure that we have all our journey maps mapped out. So that was what we did as an organization. Thank you, Ashish. Mark? Yeah, and, and to follow on that, I mean, we, we were kind of monitoring the, the COVID concerns um, as, they, as they came up. And by, by March, you know, it, it really started to, to spike in, in mid-March. You could start to see that, that trend heading upward. So, Again, you know, keeping our employees safe was paramount and our, our reasoning to take action prior to the, the 30, uh, March 30th stay at home order. So we, we began, you know, kind of mapping out what our challenges were gonna be. Um, and it, it, really it really came down to, to two 
um, essential components, our IT component and our human component, um, our IT challenge um, was we had to we had to come up with a solution that enabled our team um, to continue uh, working and delivering on our state of the art, highly accurate um, 3D maps um, while connected to our data center in the Tyson's area um, inside a remote environment. Uh, it was a, it was a huge feat that we weren't even sure was going to be possible, um, let alone work as well as it has for us so far. But that involved ordering laptops, installing the necessary software, um, getting our entire team uh, trained and ready. And that all we were able to do in, in four days, which was an amazing accomplishment for us where, you know, in the beginning with, with IT, we weren't even sure that that was, was even possible. And, and the fact that it, it exceeded our expectations was just, you know, uh, was, was, a, was a real great uh, accomplishment for us. Um, but the second component was our, you know, our, our production team is a very uh, social culture. We're, we're very collaborative. We're used to working very closely together um, and collaborate to, to build our products for our clients. So the challenge, the challenge really for us was um, to keep that uh, closely collaborative environment um, in our remote uh, setup as well. And I think technology uh, nowadays has really helped enable us to, to achieve that, that uh, kind of open and collaborative environment where if somebody has a question in the office, you could just walk right over and, and get that support. But in a remote environment, it was, you know, there, there were some challenges along the way, but with, uh, you know, the uh, technology enabling us to do remote meetings and virtual screen shares, um, it, it allowed the team to work very closely together. So uh, that was our, our human challenge that we were able to kind of overcome and and technology helped us uh, immensely with that. Thank you, Mark. So I, I think you, you all touched on this a little bit um, and pivoting was, is probably, you know, uh, the word of the day, but tell me a little bit about um, how you pivoted to specifically address client needs. Um, and I, Ashish, I want to start with you because you mentioned that Nugen has locations in 60 countries. So, so how did you approach your clients? I think, as I said, uh, communication was extremely important to us. That it all started with day zero plans in terms of communicating and directly coming from the top. The other thing that we did, uh, and our entire pivoting strategy was based upon reimagine everything, because that was the keyword that came directly from the CEO. That, hey, you know what? We are in unprecedented times. So, what is important at this time is in terms of reimagine everything in terms of your operations, question why not rather than why, mm -hmm. and then deliver how. An important thing was that it was a great opportunity for us as an organization, as an opportunity to innovate, opportunity to think about that, what we are doing, how efficient is that, and you know what can be done differently. Uh, think about it, with 3,000 people working on different projects across different countries, it was extremely important that at that point of time, in-flight projects, how can we make sure that we protect our, our revenues on that? How do we make sure that our customer deliveries are not affected? Uh, one of the things from a pivoting strategy standpoint that really worked for us was in terms of providing a lot of empowerment to the employees at the front end, because it was a time in which quick decision making was going to make a huge difference. Uh, the outcome of that has been that we have been able to raise exceptional leadership in the organization at the front end, and uh, which was always uh, unexplored, but you know we were able to unleash that potential of employees at the front end. We have been able to create very, very niche and very, very strong impeccable relationships with our customers because this was important, who we would stay with, who, who they would actually look forward to in terms of a true partner. And as uh, you know, at the beginning of the call, we were all talking about from the loan forgiveness programs and also there was a huge opportunity that we sensed out of it. The number of customers we were able to onboard in the last 30 days is equivalent to what we usually used to do in three to four months. So that has been a great outcome of uh, what we were able to achieve. And I guess uh, from a preparedness standpoint, a very important thing was that uh, there's something our chief administrative officer always says that the more you sweat in peace, the less you bleed in war. I think that was going to be extremely important. And I think that has made us more prepared for the future terms also. 
Well said, Ashish. Um, Gautam, uh, talk a little bit about addressing client needs at Alpha Omega. Thank you, thank you, Jitinda. Uh, um, so let me let me see. Um, you know, the foundation pillars of a culture, um, Jitinda, are our key core values create harmony with uh, a work-life balance, inspire innovation, and, and delight customers. And, and so we took these three uh, a lot more seriously during, during these testing times. Uh, I, I told you that there was a surge in productivity, not only because of our increased engagement, but also because of the small things we did. Uh, for example, we shipped 25 masks to all Alpha Omega employees and another um, 2,500 masks we hand delivered to gro uh, grocery stores uh, for, for their employees based on our employees uh, choosing. You know, we gave them an option to choose what grocery stores they wanted us to deliver masks to. Uh, we shipped laptops to employees if they needed one so they could get back onto uh, productivity. These small actions, um, though seem irrelevant, had uh, huge payoffs and dividends. Um, you know, a recent accolade for, for Alpha Omega is, is we built and enhanced the SPA systems that support the PPP loans in response to COVID-19. Um, this meant a huge, I mean, a, a surge of work, new contracts, and sole sources. Um, Alpha Omega helped build and 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 um, helped SBA process about three forty nine billion in loans and continue to process an additional three hundred ten billion in in the second round of loans. Right, we we followed one simple rule: to to not interrupt any activity because we are working from home. So we enrolled 70 new employees, all remotely. The magnitude of change was considerable, including remote orientation and, and every other activity being con conducted now on MS Teams. So when you work from home, there is a surge of work with all these new contracts. You slowly start working seven days a week and sometimes 18 hours a day. Um, you know, uh, I had to personally ask a few employees to take time off to recuperate rather than burn out. And then, you know, I have a, a 12 week old and um, I'm sorry, 16 week old now and, and a three year old. And so it was important for, for us to work with several of our employees to kind of ensure that they have this work life balance. So the, these are a few of the things that have really helped us provide better, better service to our customers. Thank you, Ashish. Those were great examples and, and really, you know, um, finding opportunity in adversity. Uh, Mark, talk a little bit about Rikon and, and its customers and, and how you address their needs um, when everybody had to suddenly go remote. Yeah, I, I think um, <clears throat> as, as uh, Gautam said that the getting the plan started early, I think, was, was the uh, critical uh, element for us and, and really helped us um, can continue continu continuity of uh, business operations. I think um, when we started uh, in mid-March, we uh, came up with a hybrid solution. Um, we were very concerned uh, to, to make sure we were staying safe and that the initial concerns were there um, long before the, the stay-at-home order was, was made. Uh, we wanted to provide uh, a solution um, we weren't sure, again, we weren't sure if it was, if it was going to be possible and how well it would work. Um, so we decided to come up with a hybrid solution where we had half of our team would work remotely, the other half would distance themselves at the office. Um, and depending on how the, the uh, successful uh, rollout of that uh, remote setup would work, we could uh, eventually uh, have everybody uh, go remote that was the the full plan but we wanted to see how uh, if it was possible um and then we were able to test and and uh, uh tweak the remote software and 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 uh test connection speeds um that was one of the challenges we had um solving the the it and human issues as we said before um it, with virtual collaboration tools worked much better than we thought and had we been scrambling after the order 
um, that was just not not in our, our thought process. We thought we need to get out in front of this and test and make sure we can continue delivering our products to our customers with uh, very little interruption. We've had very good success um, in our um, remote environment, um, much better than, than we'd hoped. Um, we, we knew we would take a, a hit in the production and productivity uh, uh, numbers, but we're, we're actually at about 80 to 85 percent of what we were at the office, if office is 100 um, percent, and all while keeping everyone safe. So that was our, our main goal. And again, starting early, I think, was um, our, our, you know, critical to our success um, and allowed us to, to minimize the, the uh, startup costs. Um, you know, we're very lucky, Mark, that we have exceptional connectivity in this part of the world. And, and I have to say that has really helped us um, in, in migrating everything online. But I want to go back to uh, something that actually all three of you have consistently touched over, your people, uh, your employees. And, um, you know, uh, Gautam, you touched on this a little bit about having very young children. Um, Ashish and Mark, I'd love to hear from you, um, you know, how is work-life balance, whether it's your personal story or whether it's connecting with other employees, uh, how, how are you managing that right now? Ashish, you're on mute. So on the personal front, my older one is going to college uh, in the next couple of months, so missing their proms and all the parties and all that stuff was a big deal. Yeah. But I think, you know, uh, I think we learn a lot from our kids uh, in terms of how they have adjusted to the new normal and how the next normal is going to be. So with our employees, with my distributed teams right now, it was extremely important that all of them, they feel connected. And, and you know, uh, these are the times when you establish those connections, not only with your customers, but your employees, because at the end of the day, they are the ones who are going to deliver things to manage the expectations and commitments that we have. So what we did was that uh, we, we changed our models in terms of our communication part itself. Uh, as I said, that empowerment to the front end employees in terms of making them rise up to the occasion was extremely important for us. And a lot of them, it actually helped us uh, as an opportunity to innovate a lot. And in terms of making sure that uh, the communication meetings that used to happen on a monthly and a weekly basis now started happening on a daily basis. These are short connect kind of things. And then employees were allowed to run their own stuff. The other things that we did very nicely was in terms of a lot of these employees who were distributed, we also reached out to their own uh, families and their, their parents or all these people because that was the best way to connect with them and making sure that there is a, a company behind them. There is a whole organization behind them in these times. So I think those are a couple of things that we did and it worked very well for us. I think we have got created relationships for a lifetime now. Thank you, Ashish. Mark? Yeah, and, and to follow up uh, with, with what Ashish said, it is, uh, you know, just a, uh, it is, it is a, tough, a, a tough thing for our team. Our team was so social and so collaborative. Our, our culture was, was very open, and, and that was one of the things right away we saw that that was a challenge was our team, you know, needs that, that be able to reach out. So we, we initially started with several uh, meetings and, and uh, virtual meetings to, to tag up and talk to each other. And that, that ended up starting to be scheduled where we would schedule that with um, each and every team member and, and just do a quick check in and say, you know, how are things going? Are you, is, is, is there anything you need? Is there anything we can help you with? To then you know, branching out to say, you know, you guys can set the pace and tone of, of communication. If you feel like you want to collaborate with somebody, you can't just get up and go walk to their desk anymore. Um, but you can reach out via, um, you know, a chat or a, a screen share and collaborate with each other. And it was, it was a little awkward at first. Everybody um, had to kind of get used to it. But after that, I think um, many people were welcome. We started with meetings every day and it was like, okay, well, we don't really need meetings every day, but then it, it kind of swung back around and said, well, it would be nice to have some contacts. So let's, uh, let's tag up, say hello. And then, oh, by the way, I have some, uh, some issues to discuss and take a look at this. And it really moved from the need to, to make sure everything's okay to them, you know, the, the team kind of telling us, yeah, we're, uh, we're, we're 
well supported and and I even heard uh, some of our analysts even say hey i'm I'm communicating better now than I was um, in some cases in the office so mm -hmm. uh, it really it really was uh inspiring to see everybody make the adjustment you know we we kind of uh, pushed the ball you know toward toward the hill and, and got it rolling with with the team and they just kind of picked it up and ran with it so i I got to give a shout out to our team um, they they really uh, pulled together and, and did what was necessary given the tools and the, the situation we find ourselves in and in the new normal um, uh, is, is the best phrase. So, yes. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I certainly uh, miss being in the office and just popping into one of my colleagues offices. Um, but uh, I think everything that you just said, um, those strategies have really, e even in our office, been implemented and been very successful. Um, I want to go back a little bit. I think all three of you, you know, reflecting back to your responses uh, and looking back, um, you know, what, what were the lessons learned? You know, what would you have done differently? Um, I think we've talked about successful strategies, but, I, but I'd also like to hear from all of you um, if this happened again, and it won't, um, what would you do differently? And Gautam, I want to start with you. Uh, thank you, Jatinda. You know, I, I, I um, joke with my team. Uh, I tell them Alpha Omega is finally digitally transformed. Uh, it took a virus to do that. Um, but, but on a more serious note, um, you know, from a, from a business perspective, um, you know, working from home has shown us how, how, uh, how to be more productive at a lower cost. Um, that that's important for most businesses. Um, however, it's, it's not always about the money. Um, over the last few months, Jatinda, to our disbelief, we have watched our daily lifestyle of camaraderie and friendship morph into a version which to some is unrecognizable. While the new norms of isolation and social distancing have temporarily threatened our ability to partake in simple pleasures like meeting in the break room over lunch or coffee, um, we need to find a delicate balance between working from home and uh, the lifestyle of in-person camaraderie. And I say this only because, uh, you know, uh, transitioning into um, a balance between work from home and in-person camaraderie would, would have been extremely beneficial. Uh, and you spoke about what would we have done differently. You know, um, we, all, we had the flu season every year, and I feel, um, you know, we should have been a lot more prepared in terms of having, say, temperature screens while coming into the office, um, you know, uh, and, and, and maybe glass panels between cubes, uh, change the open workspace into cubes, um, because that would help us to keep this delicate balance between work from home and, you know, uh, in-person work, right? Um, see, our employees' health and safety and well-being will, will always be a central consideration in every decision we make, right? And, and when addressing uh, both the potential dangers of co-working in, um, um, of, of the co-working environment in the wake of a pandemic and the stress of isolation and seclusion one may face when working from home every day, uh, you want to keep your employees primarily on top of your mind. Mm -hmm. Now, you know, given these circumstances, I'm uncertain when or how quickly we will uh, return back to normal or even what our new normal would look like. But I feel if I had, um, you know, if I had to do this all over again, I would start creating this delicate balance, um, you know, sooner, sooner than, than, uh, than later. Um, right. uh, that's what I would, uh, that would be the main thing I would do, uh, Jatinda. In the past few days, we have been working tirelessly to find innovative ways to provide for continuous 
engagement of a of of a remote workforce, right? It's it's a characteristic of federal contracting where mm -hmm. you have a few employees working in the head office, and most of them are working at customer sites. For us who um, you know, for us who work in the who have a presence and work in the Middle East, we've learned a a, a big lesson on engagement. Um, we plan to you know uh, plan to promote a culture to our remote locations. I mean, that would be another thing that I probably would, would have done um, if I had to do everything over again. And, um, you know, uh, and the recent change in work style has implored each and every one of us to tirelessly chant the mantra, innovate or die, I read this somewhere, and, um, you know, in support of our customers. Uh, and our productivity and engagement prove that we've just done that and I feel um, that would be something I would have adopted a lot earlier if I had a chance to do this all over again. Mm. Well, Ashish? Sure, I think uh, Gautam, Gautam actually encapsulated everything so well. Mm. Uh, I think for us, uh, I would say the lessons learned, I would say, is more in terms of be prepared for, and as I said earlier on, scenario analysis of what can go worst and, and normally in in the in the nature of work that we all were in and we all were sometimes we get complacent sometimes we get very comfortable with what we are doing in terms of our business models but i think there is a need to shake up the models every now and then in terms of questioning that uh, is there a better way of doing things and we should be continuously exploring on that so one of the things that we incorporated back into the organization was that every few months, and now it is actually happening every every month, I would say that in terms of scenario planning on what we are doing, is there a better way of doing things? Cost optimization would be a great thing for all the organization. I'm sure everybody has, has their you know boardroom meetings going around on those parameters. But I think important thing would be that can cost optimization be brought up by improvement of your processes, the way you do things. I think that would be one of the things that we have already started doing that and it's it's going to be extremely important for us. Uh, one of the things that I would also like to bring to the table is that the reality check is really important. While nostalgia is great, but reality check is important because nostalgia about hey, those were the good old days, but that's fine. But the next normal is going to be different. So adaptability to the new normal that's gonna be there, it's, it's going to be extremely important. And I think it starts from the leadership. So once the leadership starts practicing those things, I think the ranks across the organization do follow that. And also in these times, one of the great things that we have learned as an organization is that in the next normal, it's important that ecosystems are going to survive and thrive. And it's not about the individuals. So making that team culture is going to be extremely important, not only within the organization, but outside the organization with our partners and suppliers too. Thank you, Ashish. Well said. Mark? Yes, and I, <clears throat> I'd like to say it was well said by both Gautam and Ashish. That, that is exactly true. There's a lot of similarities. I mean, we come from very different backgrounds um, on the panel here, but I think the, the message is the same. Um, the, the, it's, it's really difficult to say, um, you know, what the new normal is going to look like, but the way, uh, the, I, th I think the, the lesson learned for us was uh, taking a look at the situation and trying to stay out ahead of it rather than, um, you know, wait and see. I don't, I don't think any of us could afford to do that, um, especially with, um, you know, a production team and our, our uh, kind of our collaborative environment. I think that was, that was the big um, question mark for us. We knew technology would allow us to uh, be able to connect, but could we still uh, maintain some uh, productivity, you know, in the remote environment with, with the collaboration that we need with our team and, the, and the, the, the closeness that the team has, which is now prohibited because of the, the, you know, ensuing pandemic. So it, it was uh, rising to that challenge. And, you know, I can't say enough again to, to our team um, for, uh, you know, senior leadership and, and putting together a plan to say, let's start, you know, investigating and, and seeing what our options are and how viable they are for, for our team because we are going to have some challenges. Um, but then again, you know, the, the adaptability of, of our team to be able to say, okay, here is, 
you know, it's not normal anymore. And, and you know, I, I like uh, Gotham's uh, everybody, you know, uh, meeting at the water cooler and having a discussion or um, having get togethers and just that social interaction now being missing, you have to fill that void somehow for, for work-life balance. And I think it was important for us to also realize, well, there is that, that work-life balance that has to happen too. So we don't want somebody working, you know, 12, 16 hours a day, seven days a week. That just isn't going to work. You're going to, you're going to burn out. So, um, yeah, I think, I think it was, it, it was important for us to, to, to start early and to prepare ourselves for, for the new normal, whatever, whatever that is. And we adapted well to it. So we're, we, we feel pretty good about, um, what that new normal looks like and, and we feel we're prepared for it. Thank you, Mark. Um, uh, I'm looking at time and I would love to continue this, this conversation uh, among us, but I have a lot of questions from the audience that I would like to get to. Before I do that, however, um, I'd like to ask the audience, now that you've heard our panelists, uh, we'd like to launch a poll and gauge your interest uh, and your uh, input. Um, I, I think we, we would all be interested in knowing if you thought that your business was well positioned to successfully pivot when the pandemic hit. You want to end the poll at this point? You'd like to show results, please? Very nice. Um, going back to audience questions, um, gentlemen, um, one of the first questions that I have uh, is, um, how are organizations looking at new normal ready readiness as potential states and organizations consider reopening. Um, so whether you're looking at processes or you're looking at client engagement or em employee awareness and engagement, how are you making sure your organizations are ready for, th for the reopening? And I can uh, maybe uh, answer that, um, just in the, um, you know, we've, we've already started preparing uh, by transforming our office from an open workspace, which we had, right? We, this was, that was the new trend a few, few months ago or, or uh, a few years ago, uh, when we were transforming the workspace to now have uh, cubes with glass screens, um, you know, and, and as you enter the office, I mean, we are a TS uh, top secret care facility. We're making sure as we enter the, I mean, we are restricting access to uh, employees only. Uh, we are putting in uh, heat screens, um, uh, deep cleaning crews three times uh, a day. You know, it's, it's expensive, but, but I feel it's necessary. Um, and, and um, you know, several other small precautions uh, to both keep people at a distance, uh, but allow some interaction. Um, we're also, trying to uh, provide some sort of a work for, I mean, we're trying to get a delicate balance between working from home and working from home, uh, working from uh, work. And, and the key consideration is our employee safety. Um, working, I mean, a number of us who have been working from home, some, I mean, some of us who have small kids have found it a little challenging. Um, you know, you, you, you might hear my three-year-old now walking in uh, to say hi to the, 200 or so participants on, on, on this, I mean, on, uh, on this call, for example. And, and so, you know, just managing that plus managing um, work at home has been challenging. So it's, uh, and some, some folks have found it very stressful. So we want to have a delicate balance to ease back into work with several precau precautions, some of which I've mentioned. Thank you, Gautam. Ashish, Mark, do you want to take a stab at this as well? Because I feel like this is a question that, you know, our audience would love to hear from you as well. 
Sure, absolutely. So I think you know, with with states opening up, and though it's it's a good thing that uh, states will be opening up, and you know, things will come back to normal. But then again, you know, we have to be very cautious about the other things that might you know come with that. So what we have done is that with our customers distributed across locations, across countries, and across states, what we have done is that we have still going to be extremely cautious on that approach. Uh, with the digital technologies that are available, we have already prepared our customers 30 days back in the time in terms of uh, the preparedness, uh, in terms of what activities can still be done. And, you know, in this entire process, we have also explored that things that required a very high touch kind of a, a, a scenarios. I think those things can be done with a no touch or low touch scenarios. So those are the things that we have tried to incorporate. And, and we strongly believe that, you know, this is going to be, uh, a lot of our customers actually have their employees have started saying that they don't want to go back to the past because yeah. what they've explored as as the advantages of uh, remote working productivity and also in terms of uh, work life balance which you know we have touched upon but i think all those things have been explored as viable alternates to a high touch scenario and uh, it certainly leads to more productivity and optimization of resources also mark Yes, <clears throat> and I mean that—that that is the, the the uncertainty right now. Is is we don't know what the what the future um, will hold as of as of this this moment in time with um, the pandemic, uh, you know, reaching reaching such such uh, high levels as it is ha here. We our ideal situation for our team, our production team, is to be back at the office in our open and collaborative environment. Um, that is not something that we're going to be able to do in the in the very near future. Um, so we, and, until we, we um, are comfortable with and, and are, are seeing, uh, you know, uh, signs that it is okay for, um, uh, you know, to return and, and, and kind of have the social distancing and have the, the techniques that are working, um, we're, we're working um, fine with our, with our operation now. Um, and until times are a bit more certain, we can uh, still reach our customers and still um, handle things in a, in a remote environment, digitally, you know, no touch um, environment and uh, still still deliver to the customer. So we are not in a rush to go back, but we really prefer that because we just, our production team works better um, collaborating and open. But until that is a possibility, we're, we're, uh, uh, we're not sure. Yeah. I think that's a nice segue to the next question that, that I have here. And any one of you can take a stab at this. Um, what are your plans for currently leased office space? Do you see your company not renewing these leases and reducing office space? Um, and then the third part of this question is, is the cost to redo your office space to allow for social distancing a big cost factor? So I think uh, I, can, I can certainly go first on that. We have uh, multiple distributed locations uh, across, uh, across countries and across states. Uh, our development center is in Tampa, Florida, and plus we've got multiple other locations also. Uh, we don't we don't think that in the short term, or I would I would say in the near term, we would think about those factors because those are the investments for the long term, and we have to decide between what's short term and what's the long term strategy for us. Uh, because any decisions that we take uh, in in a mode of anxiety or you know whether it would be having a short term impact will impact your long term goals. So. It's important for us that we make sure that uh, we don't take decisions on those factors rather than we, we try to optimize operations and, and not think about from a real estate standpoint right now, because I think that's going to be very important for us to plan for future and not have that impacted because of the short term goals. All right. Um, I, the next question actually is for Mark, uh, specifically Vrykon. Has your geospatial software also been used to map COVID-19 hotspots in the U.S.? Um, not that I'm aware of, um, but we certainly uh, can. Um, if, uh, uh, you know, if that is, uh, we, we don't have the entire U.S. mapped currently. We have a lot of it. Um, but, uh, yeah, you could certainly, uh, use our 3d maps to, uh, map that for sure. All right. And then I have a question that says, 
how do you measure the new productivity? Because I, I think we've all, you all touched on employees, you all touched on employee productivity, you all touched on work-life balance. Is there a new scorecard now to measure productivity? Yeah, no, Jatinda, uh, I think that's a great question um, because all of us, and I, I, I respect everybody's response, we all said that productivity has increased because the way we look at productivity is the number of hours that maybe someone sits in front of the computer. And I'm not speaking for anybody else. I'm talking about myself. The is is the way we, uh, I mean, the number of hours we sit in front of the computer and, and, and work, right? Um, true, we've spent longer hours right? But, um, you know, a week or two ago, I took a step back and said, hey, at the beginning of every year, we create a set of goals um, that I'd like our company to achieve by, by the uh, end of this year. And then we reconnect every three months to kind of look at our prog progress towards the goals. Um, and, um, you know, so one of these these prog progress meetings happened during the the shutdown or remote work time frame and um truthfully i have seen less progress towards these goals mm -hmm. than i saw when we were working together in the office and i'm not in preference to one versus the other it's just that um, my my objective data that i i mean we have data systems built so that very quickly, good and bad information comes from the bottom of the organization way to the top. And it's easier because we're a smaller organization compared to some of, uh, some of my co-panelists. Um, and in our review and measuring the data, you know, and when I say data from these systems, a lot of them are manual, which is like, you know, status reports and things like that, right? And so when you look at the data on, on these reports and then and measure them objectively with regards to your goals, our experience showed that there isn't as much progress, which makes me believe that the camaraderie, which is so integral to our culture, seem to be very important uh, in getting things done. And, and uh, it seems to be a less uh, stressful. Again, this is my opinion uh, based on this, this data that I've seen. So, you know, that uh, I have hope that answered the, the question that was posed, yeah. Thank you, Gautam. Um, and um, the uh, next question is, do you think you can maintain employee engagement in a virtual forum for 12 to 18 months if needed? And anyone can take a stab at this. I think uh, difficult to predict, but uh, it's very important that we work towards that. And I think it all starts with, you know, employ empowering your employees to take up decisions, because if you're making, see, think about it, like we used to do annual business reviews or quarterly business reviews and all that stuff. What is becoming more important, the definition of that employee engagement has completely changed. If you allow your employees to rise up to the occasion, take up responsibilities, we, we launched a program in which uh, employees can come up with some ideas, some thoughts that they would like to take ownership of. Now, if you are just having an idea, rather than that, if you run with that idea, that, that's an important thing for employee. Uh, in order to get teams engaged, especially, uh, if your employees have a thought process that, okay, they can improve things and something that has a shorter time frame from an impact standpoint. Because if you look at it from, if we make plans, if those plans have got to have some kind of outcome six months down the line, one year down the line, the whole thing has changed. The dimensions have changed in terms of taking those, those weekly goals in terms of what you want to do. They can be very small milestones, but breaking down the project into multiple smaller milestones and let employees run with them has been extremely successful for us in terms of engaging employees and make them feel relevant to the organization in the scenarios. Thank you, Ashish. So we are almost out of time, but I do want to have one more question here uh, for totally selfish reasons. Uh, please tell me how your location in Northern Virginia helped, them th helped you thrive uh, in this environment. You know, uh, we have an, um, I, I'm sorry that I just jumped in, but uh, can't help that. Uh, Jatinder. So, so Northern Virginia, right? Strategically, we have an, uh, we are gifted because we have an um, economy proof or a downturn proof um, economy 
with the federal contracting space, right? So I feel we are in a better position. And, and, and that, that's one. And, and secondly, because of a strategic location and access to universities, uh, you have a more educated um, group of people coming in. And, and, and it may not, I mean, may not help uh, many other businesses, but, but because we try to hire, uh, you know, uh, sometimes um, some of the brightest coming from schools, I feel um, that helps as well. So location is an important criteria, uh, you know, compared to me being in some uh, remote part of the US, I feel being here has drastically helped us, you know, both cope with um, the virus as well as continue productive work and keeping our customers happy. So uh, just, just one thought on that particular point. I said that I think seven or eight years back on one of the EDA uh, panels earlier on, I think one of the things that uh, always, always helps is that when you are in a place where not only the ecosystem works for you as an organization, but also the ecosystem works for you as, as a GPS. And I guess, you know, I, I said that about EDA. So the good work that you guys keep on doing in terms of connecting the, the businesses to the community and then businesses amongst themselves, I think that has always worked very well for us. And I think... This area, as Gautam said, always, always has been, you know, our first choice. And I guess, you know, it, it worked very well for us from a resource standpoint, from an infrastructure standpoint, and also from an overall support standpoint. Yep, well said. And just a final comment for, uh, for, for uh, this question. I think that is, uh, that is the, the point. It's, it's the, the people and the, the communication. Um, and we're, we're fortunate that it is a, um, we, we have good, you know, internet service providers in the area to allow us to um, connect to each other and, and uh, continue um, doing the good work that we do and, and uh, continuing continuity of business. Thank you, Mark. And with that, unfortunately, we are out of time. I, I will say that on behalf of me, my colleagues, and the entire audience that is watching today, Thank you so much to our esteemed panelists for giving us their time today. Um, I circled a couple of a, a couple of themes that came out of this uh, scenario planning, reimagining everything, uh, inspiring innovation, and opportunity to give back, along with em empowering employees. So, on that note, I will close, and I will leave you with words from Spencer Levy who is chairman of America's research and senior economic advisor at CBRE. He, earlier this week, uh, he spoke with our staff and said about Northern Virginia and Fairfax County, resilience will not go away. Thank you panelists, thank you audience. And with that, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, Juhi Nathani, to take us to a short break before our next panel, Juhi. Thank you, Jitinder. That was a fantastic panel, very inspiring, very motivating. And I hope our audience has learned a lot from it. So like Jitinder said, we're going to go into a short break now and come back at 9.15 for the panel you see in front of you, Technology to the Rescue. So 9.15 a.m. U.S. Eastern, which is in about 12 minutes. We'll see you then.